All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes till short uh, start time. So uh, I'm just gonna let everybody who attendees start joining in with us. Um, we have our panel list of Alex and Jim. Uh, I'll be giving you a little brief rundown of their credentials with us tonight. And um, stand by, we're gonna have a good night. So uh, you should see my screen. Uh, Wilderness First Aid, that's what you're here for. Hopefully you're an outdoor enthusiast that wants to do things right when you're going out into the nature, nature scene. Um, questions will be answered on the question answer function at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your questions and answers, or we'll, we'll type back the answers to you, but, uh, or we'll answer them live during our, our um, show here. So have a crack at that. Um, chat function will work too, but we prefer that they all come in through the, the question answer. All right. And I am not having luck. This happens all the time. Every time I share my screen, I stop doing it. I can't see anything. If you're answering the question. Is everything all right there, guys? Yep. All right. Um, Sorry, I guess you should show all of us. Here we go. We got our friends here. And when, when we get this thing started rolling, we're gonna start off with some polls, have some interesting polls that we'd like to hear your results from. Uh, so get ready to participate on that end. All right. So we still have a bunch of people drop, dropping in right now. I'm gonna give it to 602 just before we start. And remember, after the webinar is uh, over, I will be sending out a links page that will give you uh, some further information for research. Uh, you will get a lot here tonight, but I will tell you this is an, usually an all day or a couple day course that uh, if you want to cover it thoroughly, uh, you could expect to spend some time doing some hands-on stuff. But with this venue, we can't do that obviously, but we're trying to give you some of the things to consider to go out into the um, nature with uh, safety in mind and being able to uh, help someone else, help yourself and come out of there safely in case you have an emergency event. All right, so it's 6.01. I'm gonna go ahead and start off our uh, evening here with a couple of polls. Here's the first poll that's gonna start. And I'm gonna allow our panelists to vote also. And here it goes. Have you ever had to render aid in the field you were not expecting. Oh yeah. Now, you guys, I know that's true, but <laughs> have you ever had to render aid in the field you were not expecting? Meaning you're out and thinking nothing bad's gonna happen. And all of a sudden you're just like, oh, holy smack, this is a, a live event. We gotta take care of something. So we're gonna give it two more seconds here. Uh, getting a lot of people responding. I appreciate your responses. And I'm gonna close it now. All right, here's the results from that poll. So once again, have you ever had surrender aid in the field you were not expecting? 63% uh, said yes, and 37% said no. I'm sure there's some stories out there of some different things that uh, could be happening. All right, let's go to another um, poll. Uh, continue. This is another poll. This is the same one, sorry. I'm not sure how come it showed it like that. What's going on? Oh, there it is. Drop down. There's two questions in this one. Here it goes. What type of training should you consider taking before going on an outdoor outings? CPR, s'more building, how to make walking sticks, basic first aid. That's question number one. Question number two, how much water should you carry on a day hike? None, as long as you're pre-hydrated before the hike. I think they call that pre-gaming in other realms. Uh, one 16 ounce bottle, you shouldn't carry uh, too much weight. Half a liter of water per hour and one gallon of water per hike. So there's two different questions. Please cover those. Everybody's kind of, wow, a bunch of them answered at the same time. Okay, somebody wants to build s'mores, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Walking sticks too, all right. 
So we're gonna go with the end of results. Here we go. I'm gonna share. Well, we have an overwhelming basic first aid. That's good. Uh, CPR being second. That's good. Some people want to build s'mores and walking sticks, which, hey, those are good too. And then when it comes to the water, uh, it seemed like everybody answered that one correctly. Half a liter of water per hour. That's the number one choice. Um, some say 16 ounce bottle. Well, that's going to be a short hike, right, <laughs> Alex? And yeah, that's usually what happens. And then we go out and rescue you. Yeah. And then one gallon of water per hike. Uh, that would just depend on how long you're planning on your hike being. So try to make sure you have at least half a liter of water per hour. All right. So we're going to stop sharing those results. And let me introduce you to my panel. This is uh, Alex and Jim. Um, I have a slide for them, to show you their credentials. And are you seeing my main slide? Did I pick the right one? No, one more down. Um, one more down. Well, yeah, I know it's one more down, but let me make sure it's... Uh, yeah, we see the main one. Yeah. All right. Can you see Alex and Jim? Is this not showing it on my side? Oh, there it goes. All right. Robert's telling me something here. Mention Kinch. Yeah, I did mention the question and answer in case some of you are there. Uh, there's no questions coming in, so maybe they're figuring out, hey, something's not right. If you do have any questions, make sure you answer in the question answer. Um, that will be the function we'll use to answer your questions. So tonight with us, we have Alex Van. He spent 38 years in the fire service, uh, 30 plus as a paramedic, and 20 years of search and rescue, uh, five years with the search and rescue with the canine. 25 years as a hazardous material specialist and he enjoys spearfishing and hunting. You can see there he's helped us out before with these clinics uh, and the turkey uh, clinics that we've had. And welcome back, Alex. His partner in crime tonight is Jim McDonald. Um, he has 37 years as an ocean lifeguard. I had to shorten this up. Uh, he did get to do this in Catalina, but uh, on, the, on the slide, he just had way too much information. But uh, <laughs> he has 15 years as a paramedic rescue boat captain, 15 years on Catalina uh, Research and Rescue, uh, 25 years of underwater rescue recovery and swift water uh, rescue team work also. So dive instructor and he's one of our fine hunter ed instructors. Uh, so is Alex. Uh, we have many hunter ed instructors joining us tonight. So thank you all for your service. And I can't wait to see you all again. So I'm going to stop my share and give the screen back to Alex. Um, Alex, we've covered a couple of topics tonight um, already and just the poll questions. But basically what I wanted to do tonight, and I've talked to you about this, is give people all the information and the preparedness so when they go out into the field that they can avoid um, you know, getting themselves in trouble through any type of a medical emergency. So. I'll let you go at it, and if we have any good questions coming in, I may stop you uh, mid midway through and uh, ask you some of those good questions. So take it away. All right, thank you very much, Sean. Um, anyway, we already talked about the intro questions, but we'll get right into the PowerPoint. Okay, Alex, you're on your uh, your creator mode. If you can put on the slide, there you go. Yeah, there it goes. Perfect. Sorry about that. No problem. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, so preparing for the outdoors. Um, before you leave, before you even consider leaving, you got to make a plan. You got to prepare for where you're going. You have to know your environment. Me as a diver on an oil platform, I have to think of completely something different than going to the local mountains for a day hike. And what are your survival skills? I don't mean rubbing sticks together to make a fire. I mean, what conditions are there going to be out there? Everyone knows if it's raining, you need to bring a raincoat. But for some reason, when they go out in the wilderness, all those things people forget. And what kind of emergencies can you anticipate outdoors? Everybody's got different experiences and you just gotta keep thinking of all of those things, plan and prepare, plan and prepare. And I'll be driving that home quite a bit today. Right? Because your actions can equal life or death, right? Know your environment. You know, this moose is out on a tarmac with a jet. I mean, 
you got to know your environment where, you know, you got to know your location. You got to know the weather. You have to know, if, are there any dangerous animals out here? You know, and it, it, it all depends on where you're going and what you're going to anticipate. And the best way to find that out is to go on, you know, we all have smartphones and iPads and computers. You can do a lot of research in what you can expect in that environment and where you're going. Right. I always recommend carry a topographical, topographical map and compass or a GPS if you're in remote or unfamiliar areas. Learn how to read a topo map and then get a GPS. Right. Topo maps, you know, you have contour lines. Contour lines, if they're close together, what does that mean, Jim? Steep. The closer they are, the steeper they'll be. Yeah. And declination, what does that mean? How do you orient the map to make sure you're pointed to true north or versus magnetic north? You have to know that to make sure that you're going in the right direction, right? And again, search the local area. You can do Google Maps, AAA. You, there's all kinds of resources that you can get in order to do that, right? No, such as elevation, average temperature. If you go to Mammoth in November, December, you can pretty much expect you could have very cold weather. But if you go in July, you can also inspect very cold weather. You know, you have to prepare for the worst wherever you go, All right? Always know where you are because the animals will, will definitely know where you are, All right? Make a plan. You gotta sit down and make a plan before you leave. But most importantly, you have to tell others of your plan before you leave. Because it doesn't do you any good if you don't tell somebody, oh, I'm leaving today. I'm going to go to the local mountains. I'm going to be gone for three hours and come back. I'm going to do a five-mile hike. It's not going to be helpful if you don't tell somebody where you're going. Oh, I'm going to try this morning. I, I know this area. I've been trying to... Uh, hunt this deer and I've been scouting that area and I'm gonna go back again for about two three hours let somebody know where you're going before you leave and stick to your plan if you're going to go to an area where you planned on scouting and then all of a sudden you change it oh I decided to go over somewhere else you know come back where do you think everyone's going to go they're going to go to the place where you initially said hey I want to go um where you, where you told everybody where you're going to go Right. Know your limitations, right? Everyone's got medical conditions. You know, know if you have allergies, asthma, heart conditions, excessive weight. I've been gaining a few pounds over the years, unfortunately, but that's that's just human nature. Growing up. Yeah, growing up. Yeah, getting old, <laughs> you know, and your physical ability. I'm not going to be able to do the hiking I used to do when I was 20 or when I was really into mountaineering, but you really have to make sure you, you know what your physical ability is to perform safely, All right? Mental attitude will important is number one because it'll impact your performance. If you don't think you can do it and you keep saying that, you won't be able to do it. But if you keep having a positive attitude, you will do very well, All right? Know your equipment, check, check, and recheck your equipment. I lay it out every, every season, depending on when I'm hunting, I lay out all my gear, I check my list, I, I look at what I need, making sure I have everything, and then I, I recheck it, you know, and I maintain an updated list. Oh, I've had these hand warmers forever in my bag. Well, maybe I need to replace them because it may not work. So that's something else that you may want to consider. You know, some things do expire, you know, but I always maintain a, uh, a list and I recheck it before I leave and when I come back. All right. Know your emergency plan, maps, the first aid kit. Notify someone before you leave and when you return, right? Know how to, your local, re, you know, how do you call your local rescue, right? Jim, if I was at the beach, who do I call? You know, you call the lifeguards, you go to the lifeguard tower, you, you're on a boat, you've got your uh, VHF radio to call the Coast Guard or, you know, whoever yeah. you, you know, or the yeah. lifeguards, you got harbor patrol. You know, know what's in the area where you're going, especially even even like the Rangers. You don't call 911 when you're in a park with a ranger station. 
you got to get a hold of the ranger because they'll get help to you faster than by you dialing 911 and you're going to talk to an operator who's going to try to figure out where you're at to get the resources to you when you can call directly to those resources right and how do you communicate? Do you use a cell phone, satellite? Some people use walkie-talkies. When I'm with the Boy Scouts, we have walkie-talkies for the different patrols. The old-fashioned signal mirror and whistle. You know, I have one right here. I carry with me everywhere. I'll show it in my little picture. You can see I have a little whistle. That In every kit, every pack I have, I have a whistle, believe it or not. All right, and a GPS, All right? A tour plan, I talk about that for Boy Scouts. It tells you, it tells everybody exactly where they're going, how they're going to get there, and what they're going to do, and when they come back. And that is something that I cannot recommend. I've said it before, keep a plan and stick to your plan. All right, rules of survival. Again, tell someone where you're going and when you plan to return. I, I've stressed it enough. You got to make sure you do that, right? Don't explore alone, right? Take enough food and water to last a couple of days. It doesn't take much to have a handful of bars, you know, and a backpack with a bladder so you can hold three liters or four liters of water. You know, that goes a long way if you're going to be out, you know, out hiking and make sure you get back before dark, you know, and I always carry a map and compass of the area I'm going or I'll be bringing my GPS. And orient yourself to the map and your camp before you leave. If you're using a GPS, do a waypoint at the camp so you know how to get back to your camp. You know, you can track where you've been, but you may not want to go all the way back that way. But if you have a waypoint, your GPS will guide you back to your waypoint, all right? And layer your clothing. You know, and bring extra clothing. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been on people where they decide to leave around 11 o'clock in the middle of Irvine and decide to go to the local mountains. In an Irvine, it's 72 degrees. They got shorts, a t-shirt, and flip-flops and a little bottle of water. And then they get out to the hills. It gets a little warm. They're disoriented, and now they don't even know where they're at, and they have no food. They have no clothing. And now the sun's going down and it's dropping in temperature, right? And again, I mentioned it earlier, get back before dark. Everything looks extremely different at night, right? And I always take fire starting equipment and a foil blanket. Yeah, we'll, talk, we'll show you some of that stuff after we're done with the presentation, but we'll definitely make sure that I always have a minimum of those two things and also a knife. All right, and don't panic if you become lost. Clothing. Cotton is the fabric of death outdoors. The reason why is cotton gets wet. If it gets wet, then all of a sudden it loses its thermal insulation and you will get cold because your clothing's getting cold. Wools, polar fleece, and synthetics keep their thermal protection so that you won't get cold. And always prepare for the worst weather. Right. I wish I had a job like the weathermen and women where they can say it's going to be a beautiful day and it's pouring down rain and snow and they get to keep their job. Yeah, they couldn't figure out that it was actually going to rain or snow, but that's just the way weather is. And I always recommend covering from head to toe. Your footwear should be well broken in. You don't want to break it in on the, your first six mile hike because you're not going to be going very far. And we'll talk about blisters a little bit later and always have some fluorescent orange on you. Here's a picture of us that we staged to show different levels of clothing. And for me, with the little beanie, I don't think that's enough orange. My friend Dario's wearing the proper vest. The other two guys, no orange at all. And you can easily get lost and found if you have orange, because orange is not a natural color in the environment. So that's something that's the reason why we actually um, require it when you're hunting is because, and, and deer don't see orange either. So there's no reason to not have orange with you, All right? So if you do get lost, there's three priorities, shelter, fire, signal, All right? Once you have these, you can focus on water and food. But if you brought a couple of days of water and food, 
then you won't have to worry about those and shelter fire signal. Now you still have to be careful with fires. Right now, this is gonna be an extremely dry year in California. As a firefighter, you gotta make sure you don't start a, a major fire. Yeah, you might get found faster, but you're on the hook for all the damage that that fire causes, all right? So when, you're, when you are lost, you're gonna sit, you're gonna think, you're gonna observe, and you're gonna make a plan. I highly recommend you do the first three unless it's dire situation where you have to make a plan. Because if you told somebody where you're going, tell them when you're gonna to plan to be back, they should start thinking about, hey, um, Uncle Guido went out to the forest, he went here, but he hasn't come back yet. You might want to start thinking of calling 911 and getting rescuers out to that location if he hasn't returned or she. Because you can survive weeks without food, days without shelter, hours without water, but only minutes without breathing. So make sure you sit, think, and observe, all right? Get into wilderness first aid. So I look at some of these questions first? Let me see. All right. So some of the, this is a really basic wilderness first aid and it's recognition. First thing you have to do is you have to recognize there's an emergency. And once you recognize that and there's an ill or injured person in a remote area, how are you going to get that person out of there? Time and resources are extremely different than if you're at home and you can dial 911 because somebody's hurt outside your home or in your home. But outdoors, it's very limited. And then you have the environment to deal with and then you have time to deal with because it takes time for people to get to you. Uh, there we go. Um, some of the unique aspects of wilderness. You know, it's the environmental stress, heat, cold, wet, altitude, right? Biological hazards, you have difficult terrain, long distances, limited resources. There's a psychological impact of being isolated or in a dangerous situation, right? Um, do you need to do long-term care because it's difficult to get the person out? Or do you leave the person because you have to go get help? Those are all extremely psychological impact on you and the person that you're rescuing, you know, you're, person that you're rescuing, right? You know, you, you want to avoid them or prevent them if possible. They are called accidents. You know, accidents happen all the time, you know, but you gotta recognize when they happen, assess the problems, treat the injuries, treat medical problems if you can. There's not much at, in basic first aid to treat medical conditions, but you can treat environmental issues. You know, if they're out in the hot sun, you can get them in the shade, get them some cool water, um, or if they're in cold, you can maybe give them some of your clothing to warm them up. So those things you can help in the environment, in the environmental problems and dealing with psychological stress. This person's injured. They got a lot of fear going on. You know, what's going to happen? Am I going to be rescued? Am I going to be out here? Am I going to, you know, there's other animals out here that are bigger than me. You know, all those things go through somebody's mind and you can help, help that person just by calming them down and talking to them. All right. Any medical problem that can happen at home can happen in the, in the wilderness. Um, but the only problem in the wilderness, they can become extremely life-threatening due to the distance uh, from medicines and EMS. Um, it's really hard to know that somebody's having chest pain or breathing problems and we have nothing to treat them with. And, but knowing how to activate EMS and get them there quickly, that's gonna help save their life. Right. Be familiar with the medical conditions of your group and yourself. Right. Make sure they or you bring ample supply of your medication and always have an action plan in the event that one person in your group has a life threatening emergency. Again, back to planning. Right. And the other thing that you want to do is you can come across an emergency. And Jim talks about this all the time. What's the first thing? Yeah, don't bring the victim to the rescue. Yeah, you know, don't get yourself in a situation where it's above what your training, what your experience, what your physical capabilities are. Yeah, and it's, I, we've seen it a lot in our in our careers where, you know, 
you have a would-be rescuer who wants to do the right thing, and now they're the victim as well. So now we have two patients instead of one patient. All right. You want to do a, and this is a, I'm, I'm doing this pretty quickly. It's a systematic head to toe exam of what's wrong or with the injured person. All right. The one thing that people ask me all the time is how do you check vital signs in the field? How do you know if somebody's pulse rate is too fast or too slow or their breathing is fast or slow? The thing that I re use a lot in the field is capillary refill. So if you can see here where you take your fingernail and you squeeze on it and you release it, it, by the time you say capillary refill, it should be back to normal. You can also do it in the corner of your mouth on, on your lip. Um, you can do it on your toes. If your fingernails are painted, you know, you can, you know, you can do it just on the palm, on the pad of your fingers. And by, by the time you say capillary refill, it should be uh, back to normal. If it takes longer than two seconds, something is wrong. And that's the quickest, easiest way I can explain for somebody in a quick situation to check vitals, right? You know, tissue color, non-pigment areas inside lips and eyebrow, uh, eyelids, not eyebrows. Um, you know, and it's abnormal if, if it's hot or dry or wet. You know, there's all kinds of different um, conditions, but if it doesn't return within two, um, seconds, you have a problem, All right? So real quick, I want to talk about signs and symptoms. Signs is something abnormal that you see, you feel, you smell, you hear. A symptom is what the patient feels and communicates to you. So if I ask Jim how he's feeling today and his wrist is hurt, he tells me, oh, well, I'm hurt, All right? He just told me a symptom. The sign is, oh, your wrist is bent. Oh, it must be broken. That's a sign. So it's real simple body language that you can see. And sp facial expressions indicate a lot between signs and symptoms as well. All right. A typical approach um, to treat life, um, life threats, you want to do a quick physical exam, check for specific injuries. Now you might have to evacuate or not, you know, but the number one thing is scene safety, right? Why is this person on the ground, right? Did they fall out of the tree? Were they struck by lightning or were they attacked, you know, or did they trip and fall? That's something that you have to find out about scene safety. Why is that person in trouble? And what is the, the MOI is, what is the mechanism of injury? And the BSI is body substance isolation. Right, you gotta start thinking about how can I prevent myself from getting the bodily fluids from that patient onto me, All right? So going into shock, shock is just, the definition is not enough oxygen being delivered to the vital organs by blood, All right? The signs and symptoms are the same, but they vary slightly, but the effect is exactly the same. And that's cool skin, they're gonna be moist, they're gonna be dizzy, and now you need to put them in what they refer to the shock position. You wanna maintain their, their body temperature, provide sock electrical first aid, lay the person down, supine means face up, and raise their legs to get the blood from the legs to the center part of the body, right? And that's the, the simplest way I can describe shock, right? Wound care, right? Why do you need this training? The number one cause of preventable death and injury after an injury is bleeding. Bleeding control is huge. And you can use this training on bleeding control on anywhere. That's what this diagram represents. It doesn't matter where you're at, you can use bleeding control, right? One of the classes I do teach, it's a two hour class, is you know bleeding control. Right, so you have to identify the life-threatening bleeding and then stop the bleeding by either pressure, packing, or tourniquets. Right, your safety is your priority. If you are injured, you cannot help others. I've, we've mentioned this before, and I'll keep drilling it in over and over. You got to make sure that your safety is priority. You can't help somebody if you become part of the problem. 
right? If the situation changes or become unsafe, you have to stop, move to safety, and if you can, take the victim with you, all right? So some simple ABCs of bleeding control is you're gonna alert 911, you're gonna address the bleeding and then and recognize where the person is bleeding from, and then you're gonna compress and stop the bleeding. So we mentioned it earlier, call 911, know your location, follow the instructions, or who are you gonna call if you're in a park or if you're like at the beach or something like that, you're gonna to have to make sure you know how to reach the appropriate um, operator, right? Bleeding. Right. Look for the source of bleeding. Is it continuous bleeding, large volume, or pooling of blood? There may be multiple places the person is bleeding, especially from a fall. Clothing will also hide life-threatening bleeding. All right. For bleeding, right. For extremities, right. Arms and legs. You have, you know, neck, armpits, and groin. Right. And you also have the body. Right. You want to apply direct pressure and focus on the location of the bleeding, use enough gauze or cloth to cover the injury. If you don't like, the thing I always tell people, if you don't like the sight of blood, cover it and keep pressure on it. If the more pressure you keep on it, you know, it should stop the bleeding and keep pressure on it until help arrives. If that doesn't work, you can pack large superficial wounds, right? Um, deep wounds, you can pack them with gauze until the bleeding stops and then apply pressure. And we'll show you some of those things um, a little bit later, right? And compressing arms and legs, necks, armpits, and groin and body, right? So you want to hit, obviously, you don't want to apply direct pressure to the neck because now you can worry about the neck injuries as well. But you can put pressure on the sides that are affected, right? If you have to, you can go to tourniquet, which you're going to apply two to three inches above the wound. Do not place on the elbow or knee, just go slightly above the elbow or slightly above the knee and tighten the tourniquet until it stops bleeding. And do not remove it to check on it. Um, a lot of times before, um, probably 20 years ago, we didn't use a lot of tourniquets in the field. All of a sudden we're using a lot more and we're saving a lot more lives from trauma by actually using the tourniquet. And they found that, you know, the turnips were actually underused in the past versus um, overused. Hey, so now, Alex. Yeah. Really quick, when you say applied two to three inches above the wound, I just want people to realize you mean more interior to the core of the body, Between right? the wound Not, and the heart. Yeah, closer Correct. to the heart. Yeah. Yes. It may seem obvious to some, but others might say, well, what, how will that work? But yeah, we got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, and you cannot apply a tourniquet to the neck. So uh, it's something else you don't want to do either. But yeah, definitely between the wound and the heart, two inches above. All right. You can, um, yeah, and do not remove it. You can apply it to yourself. We'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Can be applied over clothes, and they do hurt. Um, and a second tourniquet may be required to stop severe bleeding. There's some examples of some tourniquets. All right. Here is some. For more information, if you want to write this down, bleedingcontrol.org and stopthebleed.org. Both, um, both these organizations I teach from, and we actually go out to local communities and stuff, especially out in the rural areas, and actually teach them about um, Stop the Bleed is one of the classes that I teach. All right. The only thing more tragic than death is a death that couldn't be prevented, um, and that's with bleeding control. So getting to, let's see what question came up real quick. Got it, okay. Um, you know, stop severe bleeding, treat for shock. If bleeding is not severe, clean the wound and need forceful irrigation to remove some of the debris. You know, protect the wounds, um, evaluate the patient. And if it's an animal bite or deep uh, facial cut, uh, you got to make sure that you seek medical help. And don't take the bandage off after you put it on to see yes. what's underneath it. Yeah. Because you become, the, the bandage can be part, become part of the clot. And if you take it off, you reopen the wound. So once you get the bandage on, the gauze on, whatever, leave it there. That'll be taken care of at the hospital. Yeah. Hey. Don't keep look. 
Alex, can you mention maybe I know we I don't know if it's coming, but uh, some of the um, clotting products that are available for for gunshot wounds or extreme bleeding. Um, yes, we have. Let me see. I have a couple of things here. Yeah. So we have a trauma pack. I have this one that you can purchase. I think I'm on. I think my screen is mirrored. So unfortunately, yeah. You're good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Then I have this one here, which is um, this has the quick clot on it. You know, this is another product that you can get, and you know, basically you can you know put it up to the camera here. Yeah. There you go. You know, you just apply it, and you can use this gauze and push it directly into the wound. You know, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of them that are available, you know, on the market, uh, like this one. It's called this one's called an Israeli wrap, and it has the quick clot in it, so that you can use it as well. It works as a pressure dressing and as the quick clot. And you don't have to be any type of medical personnel to purchase that type of. Uh, no, you can order it right online um, from your favorite online store. Thank you. Um, I recommend local stores because um, then you can actually talk to a person. If you go into like uniform centers and places that have it, um, a lot of times the staff there can give you advice on how to use it. And, you know, that is very helpful. There is ordering it online. You, there's, sometimes there's nobody there to actually, hey, I have a question about this package. You know, so that's something that you can, um, that's what I always recommend because there's somebody there to talk to. All right. All right. So the old-fashioned triangular bandage is something that I'll just kind of go over real briefly because we'll demonstrate it a little bit later on. Um, I always carry a triangular bandage. You can buy them or you can make them your own, uh, or you can use a T-shirt. Uh, you know, clothing, anything. You know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Here's, you know, this is out of the Boy Scout book. You know, you can make simple knots. You can use it, you know, for all kinds of different things. So going real quickly over different types of wounds, you have a puncture wound, that's something that's stuck in you, right? You have uh, incision, right? You have lacerations, you know, tearing, you know, those can be lead some pretty nasty jagged, you know, uh, edges. You can have abrasions, avulsions, right? Or an, even an amputation. All of those apply direct pressure and stop the bleeding. You know, if it's a small wound, where you can actually clean it and then put a bandage on it because it's not severe bleeding, please clean it and then get rid of the debris. Because the one thing you don't want to do is leave a lot of debris inside. Um, I have quite a few friends. I have one friend that has actually had to go to the emergency room once and I stitched him up once, you know, while we're processing animals. So it happens, all right? And the knives you use in game processing are razor sharp. And, you know, and you're, you're, the blood is very slippery. So you can easily lose a knife um, while you're processing an animal. So you gotta be, always be careful. Um, since then, um, I wear a chainmail glove now when I'm processing and I'm a bow hunter. I don't wanna get a fragment of my archery um, broadheads into my hand when I'm processing. So. I definitely use a chainmail glove now because because of my friend that cut himself twice. And don't if you drop a knife, don't catch it. Exactly. Just let it fall. Let it fall. <laughs> More injury. You know, we talked about this <laughs> earlier. You know, a knife or a gun. If it if if you drop it, let it fall. Right. Your gun should have your safety on, and a knife it'll hit the ground. Then you can pick it up, but don't try to grab it while it's falling. You know, that's that's something you don't want to do. All right. Um, also, make sure you found all the wounds. If somebody fell or rolled down a rocky embankment, there could be multiple wounds, uh, multiple wounds, I should say. You know, and remove foreign matter. You know, irrigation, tweezers, clean water if you can, if you have tweezers. Right. Check for, you know, distal function means if if you're injured here, distally is is away from the heart check here to make sure it's working, All right? So, and then you wanna immobilize it, uh, the injury above the heart so that it relieves the pain and swelling, All right? 
So did you want to put the blister poll question up? Yeah, actually I have two questions, uh, two, two poll questions that are related somewhere. So we'll launch them right now. So, so do I need to get out of screen no, here? No, you're good. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Here's the two poll questions that we're going to cover here. How do you stop a nosebleed? Uh, nothing, it will eventually stop. <laughs> lean back and look up, lean forward and pinch your nose. Eat something hot or spicy. And number two, how do you treat a blister? Tighten your boot to stop your foot from rubbing. Apply gopher skin, apply or pop the blister or apply mole skin. One of those is a trick, trick answer and some people are taking it. <clears throat> all right, everybody's launching in right now. They're all reading the questions. Uh, we'll give it like five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. You guys can see my results here. So the nosebleed, uh, everybody's answered lean forward and pinch your nose. Is that right, Alex? That is correct. If you wow. lean back and look up, the blood's going to go down the back of your throat and you're going to get a stomach ache and you're going to throw up. Okay. And then we usually get called after that, that they have a stomach ulcer or something wrong with their stomach because now they're bleeding from their stomach. But it's all the blood from your nose going to the back. Um, eating something hot and spicy. Hot and spicy actually dilate your blood vessels in your mouth and oral pharynx and in your nostrils. So that's why you get a runny nose when you eat something hot. So if you do that, you're gonna actually going to increase the blood flow to your nose and actually increase the bleeding. All right. And so how I do you treat a blister? What's the right answer there? Did they so it on correctly? The, on a blister, um, apply moleskin. And wow. I'll show you, I'll show you how to actually apply the blister, um, the moleskin. I got some good examples of my feet over the years. Um, but you never want to pop it. Um, and too tight of boots are actually gonna make your feet worse. So you want to make sure they're well broken in. So you have just one layer of nice socks so that you're not rubbing. And if you start to get a hot spot, you stop, put the mole skin on to cover the area so that you're actually um, protecting it from wherever the hot spot is starting before now, the blister starts. Now, there's times when I always hear of people wearing two pairs of socks. Would that help at all or not? I've never done it myself, but. I'll wear like silk socks, a silk sock with a wool sock over it, depending on the how hot or cold it is, the thickness of the wool sock. Yeah. Okay. In my, in my wildland boots, when I fight brush fires going up and down hills, I just wear one pair of 100% wool or 100% cotton socks. That's it. That's all I ever wear. All right. Well, thanks for those uh, participation on the polls and uh, hit it again, Alex. All right. There we go. All right. Proper fitting boots. Um, pad boots with moleskin, you know, or mole foam to fill the gaps if you have a large gap in your boot. Moleskin over the hot spots before the blister starts. So a lot of times you'll be walking and you feel a little part of your foot getting hot. Stop before it turns into a blister. Cover it with moleskin, and that way you'll be able, you'll feel a lot better. And tight laces and brobo area, and tape your toes before going downhill. You don't want to do it, you know, if you're going downhill, that's when you want to tighten your laces and cover your heels before you're going uphill. All right, so you can see the back of my heel has a nice little, nice blister. All the moleskin in the world didn't stop that one and this one right here. You know, it took a lot of pressure going, you know, hiking up Aconcagua. It was pretty brutal to straight up, practically. Uh, protect with moleskin, you know, you can do the donut. Um, you can cover it with, with moleskin or tape. Um, now, if you puncture the blister, you've opened yourself to a wound and it's nice and steamy and things grow down there and you can actually start causing um, an infection. So make sure you don't pop your blisters. All right. Again, you know, protecting my toes and my heel. All right, here's two blisters on the side. Um, you can see how we made the donut where it goes around the blister in the center and then you just form a nice big pad and it sticks to your skin and you can just sometimes you have to do two or three layers depending on the size of the blister. 
right? For burns, um, multiple different ways you can get burned, but the number one way is cooking accidents are the most common in the wilderness and, um, environment. We get a lot of campers that are weekend warriors. They go out for the first time or a couple of times they want to start a fire at night. The fire burns all night. In the morning, they try to get up and start the fire and they get into the fire pit, leaned over into it, they have a little bit of smoldering. They put some um, kindling on it and they start blowing on it. They hyperventilate, pass out and fall face first into the fire pit. It's one of our most common injuries in the local parks. And so that's something that it happens every, you know, at least once, once or twice a month during the summertime, All right? You wanna remove them from the heat source. You know, if they're smoldering, you know, you wanna cover the, um, cool them off, but you don't wanna to put too much water on them because cooling will actually lead to hypothermia. So you only want to cool the affected area and cover the area with whatever you have. Because if it's a second degree burn, that's where the pain is and, and temperature change and wind is where the pain comes. So you wanna make sure that you cover it and immediately get help. All right, your musculoskeletal injuries, you know, you have fractures, dislocations, sprains, stain, uh, sprains and strains. Um, there's a whole lot of information about, oh, uh, this person can tell the difference between a fracture and a sprain or a strain. You know, I always treat them all the same. I treat them as a fracture as I don't have an x-ray machine. And if you can walk on it, be very careful. You may want to tape it, um, but I treat them all pretty much the same, especially in the field. And, you know, you got to get to, you know, you got to get to help, right? And this is what they call, referred to as mechanism of injury. You trip, you fall, you put your arm out, and now you broke something or dislocated something, right? Joint injuries can be difficult. Um, you want to put them in position of comfort. Um, it's kind of hard to transport somebody if their arm is sticking straight out. You know, if their arm is out like this, it's kind of hard. So you might have to bring it in and pat it as best as you can and get them out to help. Or if it's a lower uh, extremity where they can't move, you may have to leave them there and go out and seek help. All right. So we talked about the nosebleed before. You know, you wanna lean forward, pinch it just below the bone, and you can use a clothespin with a spring to maintain pressure if you're tired, if your fingers get tired. Um, you know, in the back of the sinus is a little bit harder, but you still have to lean forward um, and keep that nostril pinched. And it's for at least 20 minutes. You know, I, I have been on a lot of Boy Scout uh, hikes with my son and the, our Boy Scout troop. And that dust just seems to kick up. And usually one or two boys on every trip will get a bloody nose. And again, you gotta make sure they lean forward and you pinch and you keep pinching for a long time. All right. Um, I put this in here because everyone wants to talk about gunshot wounds to the chest or a penetrating wound. Um, you want to use an occlusive dressing. What that means, as you can see um, in the diagram, there's three sides that are covered so that when you inhale, the wound is protected so your lung doesn't collapse. When you exhale, the air goes out and reinflates your lung. Um, you're gonna have difficulty breathing. And this is an example of one that's pre-made that you can get if you wanna carry it um, for your gunshot wounds. But um, I highly recommend taking a, a regular wilderness first aid class, um, which is usually a two or three day course so you can get a lot more of this information if you're interested. All right, exposure to heat, right? Heat problems are associated with very warm to hot air, um, it, but it can happen in 70 degree heat. And that's what people don't really realize that it can happen in such low temperature. A lot of people don't realize that you're out in your backyard, you're digging a hole, you're not drinking enough, or you're just on a nice casual day, I on a nice casual hike, but you're starting to, you're not drinking enough, you know, you're slightly overheating, you're sweating, and you can go 
from heat syncope where you're starting to feel dizzy to heat cramps, heat exhaustion, to heat stroke. Pretty, pretty quickly, believe it or not, it's, it can happen pretty quickly, right? And again, some of your risk, risk, uh, sorry about that, risk factors are high humidity, overweight, you're either young or you're old, um, you're unaccustomed to heat. When we um, take the boys down to Florida to go to Florida Sea Base, we always go about three or four days before the main trip in order to get a cut, you know, acclimatized to the heat. And believe it helps a lot if you're going into an area where it's really hot. You know, I don't know how many dove hunters are out there, but you're hunting September 1st. And I know of a lot of people that have had a lot of problems with heat on that day because that's a, you know, they live on the coast and they go out to the, you know, nice hot, dry area and now they're dehydrated and, you know, now they're starting to go downhill. All right. You, you can sweat up to three liters per hour in a warm atmosphere. Right. But if you're only drinking one liter an hour or half a liter an hour, you're going to lose quite a bit. So urine is a good indication of hydration. You want clear and copious. If it's starting to turn yellow, you're dehydrated. So it's just something to think about. If your urine is yellow, you're dehydrated. Right. Standing or walking um, in the heat. Um, basically, the blood pulls to the limbs and you're starting to feel dizzy and you need to lay down or you actually even faint. You know, we've actually seen it both ways, right? It could be um, when you start getting heat cramps, it's sodium deficiency. You're starting to get spasms. You know, um, when we go out, we usually take, I take a little bit of this, this gel with us, especially with, with the Boy Scouts, so that it adds some sodium, it's not a lot, or if like somebody wants to drink a Gatorade, um, when we're doing on a rescue, we'll have them take a sip of Gatorade, two sips of water, a sip of Gatorade, two sips of water, right? You don't want to over saturate your body with uh, the glucose paste or, you know, those salty, sugary drinks, because that's almost too much for your body. And then you can actually start throwing it up. So now all that fluid you just gave that person, they just threw it all up, right? Heat exhaustion. That's where it's similar to hypovolemic shock. They have pale skin, their pulse is rapid, their head, they can have a headache, they can be confused, they can be vomiting, they can have diarrhea. And you know, their body temperature may be normal or slightly elevated, but they're they're definitely they can no longer function correctly. And you can really see it in them that there's something really wrong with this person. And again, prevention of this is to drink, hydrate. And, you know, maybe take a break if you're working outdoors or if you're taking long hikes. Hey, maybe it's time to sit in the shade for a little bit, cool off, loosen up your clothing. Right. So, again, you want to rehydrate slowly, plenty of water, but make sure you alternate with your electrolyte drink so that you're not drinking too much. Hypotremia, um, I leave this in there only because. On that question about how much water you should bring, some people say, I'll bring a gallon. Well, I've seen people where they're sweating a lot. And what do you sweat? You sweat the salt out of your skin. You're losing salt. So now you drink that big gallon of water and you no longer have the salts. So your body, your heart needs sodium to work. And so if you don't have the sodium in you, your body starts shutting down, your kidneys, your, you know, and everything starts to become cyclic. And you start in this little spiral. And so you want to make sure you don't just chug a lug pure water when you're dehydrated. You've got to have a, a like you've got to balance the water. All right. With um, heat stroke, the body can no longer cool um, and work correctly. So you're going to be hot, you're going to be dry. And this person, you got to get them in water, you got to get them in shade, you got to cool them off because you're going to start losing you know, brain cells and internal organs because of the heat, because you're over 106 degrees and everything is starting to um, break down and the person can actually die. All right. Classic Hikato can take, you know, a few hours to days, usually a little bit older, it can, but it can happen 
I've seen it happen with firefighters, you know, within minutes. Mm -hmm. I've seen um, guys <laughs> collapse because of the heat. Was that a question? No, I'm sorry. I was laughing at a comment. <laughs> <laughs> Should I look at the comments? <laughs> no, it was, it was, yeah. Have fun, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but that's something that you need to, to really respond to quickly. All right. And again, you may be hot and dry, unusual behavior. Um, a lot of times it'll lead to coma and then followed by death. So you got to cool the person as quickly as possible. If you don't have a lot of water, um, the areas that cool would be the groin, armpits, and neck. That's the closest area you can get some large vessels, especially around the neck, where you can start cooling off the skin, which will cool off the blood going to the brain and then from the brain back to the body. Same with your armpits and same with your crotch and groin. Right, this happened to me actually down in Havasupai. Um, it's a nice 17 mile hike on the way up. It's practically straight up a lot of switchbacks. And the family left the girl because they thought she would get better and left her about four miles from the top. And then uh, luckily I was able to give her some fluid, nurse her back to where she could start walking. Um, I sent a couple of people up the trail to get a hold of the ranger, and it took about four hours from the time I sent the people up before the ranger came down to help get her out. So it can take quite a while, and just because of the remoteness of the area that we we're in. So you can by giving them small drinks and start cooling them off, and it does actually, it does help a lot. Hey Alex, here's a question related to this project: Is what are some good products to bring that bring to add sodium back to the body after? Um, stroke you know, any of the energy drinks are great. Mustard packs. You know, huh? Mustard packs. Mustard packs. You know, um, you know, REI has an assortment of different things you can have. Um, I try to stay away from the really sweet uh, energy drinks and with a lot of caffeine. You don't want the caffeine. Um, you can, you know, I use the one right here. You know, this is um, energy gel, right? It has amino acids, sodium, and it does have caffeine in it, but um, this is one of the lowest ones that I can find with the caffeine. Um, but I just use uh, some of the energy drinks that are low in sugar, but high in electrolytes is what you want to look for. And you can do the powder so you don't have to bring a, a container of it. But I usually bring one bottle of it with me in my backpack. And then the rest of it is just regular water that I would get from, work, uh, from either a stream or that I carry with me. Right. So when you go out in the hot weather, you want to stay cool, be physically fit, and acclimatize. Keep drinking as much water and salty snacks as you can. Watch your friends. You know, cold, just the opposite. You know, you're lowering your temperature, right? You know, your body, the shell pulls on the outside and you dump heat. You know, the blood pulls it back to the core to conserve heat. So that's why your, your fingers start going numb and your extremities start going numb because the body's trying to keep everything in the core, right? So that your internal temperature where your vital organs are stays at a normal temperature. But eventually it starts dropping down where you can no longer... Um, maintain heat. So you start shivering, the shivering starts generating heat, but your body still can't keep up with it. And which leads to, you know, more, more things start circling, circling, and then to eventually to you get sleepy and you pass out. Yeah. So you want to make sure you wear proper clothing. Now, Alex, I see a lot of people make a mistake of thinking they don't need water during the cool periods like this. It's is that true or? Oh, possible? no, no. You need even more water, especially if it's, if it is dry and you're below zero or maybe below 32 degrees, there's no air, there's no moisture in the atmosphere. So every breath you bring in, it has to be turned into 100% humidity. And when you exhale, you're giving away, you're, you're exhaling water and you can dehydrate even faster. And that's where people make that mistake. Or if you're not wearing proper clothing, you're gonna be starting to sweat 
and now you're wet and cold and it's you're starting to still again circling that drain where everything is starting to affect what you're doing but absolutely in cold weather you probably need to drink just about as much if not more yes right you know we talk about you know sweating inside clothing sleeping bags um you know, my wife is from Sweden and up in the great Arctic, you know, up there, you know, it's, it's a pretty, you know, everyone lives with it there, but me as a city slaver going out there, it's definitely a lot cooler and the weather causes diuresis and causes your body to urinate more. So now you're even losing more um, water, your lungs, every time, again, every time you exhale, you're losing more water. And you can't, you can't catch up. So you got to stay ahead of it. All right. Your nervous system are shutting down. Your muscles are starting to get weak. Your breathing is starting to go down, you know, to decrease. And you're going to increase in, in your ketones, kind of a fruity breath. And your metabolism starts to decrease. And your gut produces a lot of heat. And that starts decreasing. So now you can get even cooler. Here's just a quick chart, uh, chart of you know different stages of hypothermia. You know, I usually wait till I'm about 95 when I'm lobster diving because I want to make sure I get as much time in the water as possible. Um, but you know, again, dry, you know, warm clothes is what you're going to need. You know, and once you start getting into the low 90s and upper 80s, that's where it starts to get critical. All right. And you're gonna to have to alter mental uh, mental status. Again, you have to warm, and it's not where you dump somebody in a in a, ba a warm bathtub that can actually cause more damage because the skin will warm up, and then all that cold blood from the extremities are gonna to go to the core, drop your body temperature, and you can actually die from going into a warm bathtub. You want to slowly rewarm the patient. It's better to rewarm from the inside to the outside. Give them hot liquids, hot fluids so that can warm them up from the inside and warm them up from the outside to prevent uh, loss, right? Again, preventing hypothermia is dressing for survival, layering, avoid cotton, proper fluid intake, hydration, fuel. You know, you, know, you gotta make sure you eat because you, your, your gut produces, it produces the heat, right? You wanna prevent overexertion. Alcohol is the worst thing to have and watch other people in your group. All right. Uh, frostbite is when the skin goes numb at 50 degrees skin temperature and the fluid between the cells freeze. That's real basic uh, frostbite. You know, how to freeze your flesh. You know, temperatures are below freezing. You get hypothermic first where your extremities start to go numb. Uh, I experienced this uh, in Denali um, with another uh, group of hikers that were going to try to climb Denali. And they were kind of macho, wanted to go walk around, you know, in their underwear, thinking, oh, it's not cold, even though it was 20 below zero. And they started getting um, their toes and their hands got frostbite. And, you know, they could have easily prevented that, but they just wanted to show off a little bit. And then now we have to rescue them. So, you know, make sure you cover all bare skin. All right. And stay warm, well fueled, and hydrated. That you know, you want to cover anything metal, um, so you don't want to touch anything that's metal that when you're frozen. Just like in the the old Christmas story where the kid sticks his tongue to the flagpole. Uh, believe it or not, I have seen it, and yeah, we've actually had to help somebody because they thought it wouldn't happen, and it does, and it does. Right? You want to talk about submersions? <laughs> this is your this is your expertise. <laughs> oh, okay again drowning is most one of the most common uh things in children to happen and this is one of those things that you may even find more at home as well as you know out there if you're out hiking and somebody wants to jump in, in one of the river kern river every year gets you know several people that you know get swept away in the current um your watercraft injuries the people flip them get injured in different ways i've seen kids Drive those things up on rocks, um, alcohol and drugs. It's the same as if you're driving a vehicle, even though you're you're uh, on the water. 
Um, always have supervision around when somebody's around in the water. Um, make sure if you're going to certain areas that it's safe to swim, especially if you're at beaches and such like that. But when you're out in swift water areas like around rivers and streams, um, there's a lot of things that can uh, get you that you don't even see. It could be just a piece of bob wire underwater, a rock, something like that. When we do swift water work, we're all wearing life jackets and helmets. We learn how to read the river. Um, you know, we don't just jump in blindly. And uh, again, the drugs and alcohol ruins your judgment and, and just gets you to do things you probably shouldn't do. Sunburns, you know, it can cause, you know, some burns, you know, to the eye. It can actually blind people. I've actually seen where they've been blinded and it's the number one cause of skin cancer. So I always recommend when I go outside, I'm covered from head to toe. Uh, there's a lot of great fabric outside that has sunscreen protection. Uh, if you lot, watch a lot of the fishing shows now, all, all the guides and the fishermen are all covered head to toe. Right. Altitude, you actually have more uh, greater exposure. Choppy water can double the exposure. Clouds don't block UV rays. Wet skin burns faster. And depending on your medications, you become photosensitive. Right. Um, eyelids get sunburned. They're red, they're swollen, they're painful. People can't see. You can get a sunburn or snow blindness where it feels like there's sandpaper and grit um, on your eye. And you can get retina damage. You can lose your visual acuity and visual feel permanently if you don't wear proper uh, eye protection, right? Just recognize this, you know, the sun does affect you and um, to make sure that you're wearing proper sunglasses, sunscreen, hat, and limit your exposure to direct sunlight, All right? We'll talk a little bit about first aid kits when we get done, um, but, Everyone asks me for a list of first aid kits. What should I have in my first aid kit? Well, I'll show you some basic stuff you should have with you, but it doesn't do you any good if you buy a kit if you don't know what it what it does. You know, Jim and I both have you know years of experience as paramedics, and I basically carry just a few things with me. I carry some gauze, I carry some band aids, and uh, I do carry a tourniquet, but that's about it. You know, there's also some other survival items you should carry with you, like fire starting, some extra clothing, food, some water, you know, a nice backpack that you can carry it all in. You know, I don't carry um, large knives and stuff like that. I carry a nice pocket knife or a multi-tool. But all of those things, you know, you should make yourself. And um, in a few minutes, I'll show you some of the, um, some of the stuff that we both like to use. We'll get into um, some animal bites real quick. Mammals, reptiles, and insects. Um, yes. Let me go ahead and do that uh, poll questions uh, that All relate right. to this, and then we'll cover animals. So um, critter emergencies. Here's a couple of them. We're going to go ahead and launch it. How do you treat a snake bite? People have been asking this question on the question and answer in the chat. They want to know. Suck out uh, the venom out apply something cold, apply a tourniquet, apply restricting bands above and below the bite. Uh, number two, what is the best way to remove a bee stinger? Try pulling it out using your fingers. Use the blade of a knife or credit card to scrape it out. Both just get it out as quickly as possible. And number three, what is the best way to remove a tick? Put peanut butter on it, burn it off with a match, submerge it in water, or use tweezers to remove it by the head. So those are our three questions. Everybody's uh, still chiming in. We've got a lot of people still hanging in with us tonight, even though we've exceeded the seven o'clock hour. I appreciate oh, wow. that. So, uh, um, but this will be recorded. If you have to leave us, you can watch it another time. And I'm gonna end the polling now. So number one for uh, treat, a snake bite, they have applying restricting bands above and below the bite. Is that correct, Alex? That is correct. All right. And the best way to remove a bee stinger, what would that be? That should be C, get it C. out as quickly as possible. 
Yeah. So what happens, uh, some of you guys might watch those stingers. If you just leave it in, yeah, and you got to kind of weigh, well, if I squeeze it while I try to pull it out with my fingers, it's still pumping that venom into you, right? Yep. When you squeeze it, you squeeze the sack and you just put yeah. more into yeah, it. Yeah, but if you get it out real quick, it's no longer it's no longer pumping inside you. Yeah. That's the other thing is I'm a beekeeper, so I get stung quite a bit. And mm. I've learned, and it's absolutely correct, get them out as quickly as possible. And then what is the best way to remove a tick? Number one answer here was use tweezers to remove it by the head. Were they correct? That is correct. Um, right. a lot of, there's a lot of myths. Oh, put peanut butter on its butt. That way it has to release its jaws. But you gotta remember all those techniques, in order for the tick to release its jaws, it has to regurgitate back into your body. So if you put peanut butter on it, it's gotta regurgitate. That means spit what's inside its body into you. That I don't want. Same when you burn it. Same when you submerge it in water to try to drown it. All of those, it'll cause it to regurgitate. So if you take a, if you take a pair of tweezers, pluck that thing out right away, if it leaves a mandible, that's okay. You have a splinter. You can dig out the, everybody's probably dug out a splinter or two, and that's something that you can just dig out. Yeah, and that's somebody, the best way to remove a tick. Somebody Don't asked uh, regarding the ticks, we might cover this uh, a little bit later, but can you have the tech, uh, ticks tested for uh, Lyme's disease? And I think we will talk about Lyme's disease. In a little yes, bit. yes, you can have it tested. Yeah, and I have some information in the, um, webinar links that I'm gonna send out about ticks and Lyme disease and a couple of these other things that uh, you may not feel we're covering adequate enough. You'll have some really good links afterwards to, to research it a little bit more. So carry on, Alex. Right. So if you get bit by a mammal, the thing you have to worry about is rabies. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what mammal it is, you still need to be checked by a physician um, because once it goes permanent, uh, ner uh, nerve damage or neuro damage, uh, brain damage, um, it's irreversible. So if you do get bit by a mammal, you got to go and get treated by a doctor. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Oh, my PowerPoint's not working. There we go. All right. Um, you treat any bite like an open wound, take extra time to clean it. Um, like I said, you know, rabies are rare, but you definitely have to be seen by a physician. And you can also get an infection. Um, depending on how severe the wound is, you may have to evacuate immediately um, or within a day or so because you want to make sure you didn't get an infection or you get a, a uh, rabies. All right. We talked about the snake bite, venomous snakes. There's uh, 20 plus species of venomous snakes in the United States. Um, the one we have out here is the rattlesnake. And, you know, the venom is to mobilize the prey and to start digestion, right? Some are very potent, like the Mojave green, and you can expect rapid swelling and tissue destruction, right? You're going to usually, um, patients that I've had will feel something immediately, but um, due to the neurotoxin, usually it takes a little while to get the nausea and vomiting. Um, they have a lot of pain. They get that metallic taste. Um, usually, um, you want to get to help as quickly as possible, but you don't want to wait to see if you're going to get a reaction. You want to start evacuating immediately. I have seen patients where, well, I just wanted to wait here for an hour to see what happened. Well, he could have been in a hospital by that time if he would have called 911, but it just made his situation worse. So you want to make sure that you get and seek help immediately if you're bit by a snake. And I, I'm not a snake expert. I, I like eating rattlesnake and I do not play with snakes. And someone can tell me it's a gopher snake. I don't care, I'm not gonna play with it because I've seen way too many people misidentify snakes and have been bitten. And I'm not a snake expert, All right? So again, you wanna evacuate quickly you want to apply a, a bandage and restricting bands. You want to keep calm, but you might have to walk. Um, there's a saying that, you know, no swelling after 20 minutes, there's no venom. I'm not going to buy that because it might take you a little bit longer. It depends on how deep the fangs were. You know, you want to have some fluids, you, but you need to get to a hospital with antivenom as soon as possible. 
All right, spiders, there's a lot of spiders. Um, the one I'm gonna talk about a little bit um, is they're usually painful. Um, they serve as venom and they also, you know, neutralize the animal and they start digestion. So you can get cramps, spasms, but you usually recover within a few days. There's very few people that have any problems with the hobo spider, black widows, or anything else. And one we do have a problem with is the brown recluse. Um, but, you know, treatment, soap and water, clean it. And uh, for the other spiders, usually it's not a problem. But for the brown recluse spider, this is a, an organism that usually lives, you know, in Mississippi Valley up to Michigan and that area. They buy plants from other parts of the United States and they just come in on the truckload and that's how we get them here in California. And they usually only live for a season or two um, because it, the environment here isn't, for, isn't very suited for them. But their um, bite is, can be very, very nasty, right? Um, they are found worldwide. Um, but, you know, they like warm, undisturbed environments, you know, vacant buildings, storage sheds, closets, and attics. Um, it's named for the dark corners, known as a violin. Um, like I said before, it doesn't live, and it's a cytotoxin, which means the venom kills cells. Right? You want to apply a, you know, a cold compress, make sure, and, and this goes for, for any time you're outdoors, make sure your tetanus immunization is up. Um, I should have put this a little bit sooner, but that's something that you can do to prevent a lot of uh, discomfort later on. And if you do get bit by a spider and you think it's a, uh, uh, a recluse, you need to go get help immediately. Um, you want to clean it and seek medical help. All right. You know, land animals don't sting, you know, mammals, but they can serve puncture and trample you. Um, Jim, you can talk about Catalina since my son's over there with a buffalo at Catalina. <laughs> you know, just remember wild animals are wild. They don't want you to come up, take pictures of them as close as their nose or try to pet them. Yeah. Sarah, I'm, I'm, land I'm landing my plane right now, so I apologize for the noise in the background. But um, yeah, you know, here's a picture. You know, Jim and I met over at Catalina working together. What now? Twenty-five years? Yeah, yeah, or so. <laughs> yeah, we've been together, so we've been been we've been around for quite a while. But here's a good picture of my son next to a bull buffalo. Um, he's actually in between two cars, but you can't see the other car. But it looks kind of neat. But they definitely can trample you. So just because they look all calm and nice, they can definitely um, do some damage to you. You know, scorpions, the little Arizona bark uh, scorpion. They're small. You know, the body is about the size of a half dollar. It's a pretty large one. It mostly feels like lightning, um, you know, bolts of electricity coming from the, from the injection site. And only lasts for, you know, for a day or two. But fatalities are very, uh, very rare for the Arizona bark uh, scorpion that we have here in the United States. There's other ones around the world that are dead, but not the ones in the United States. All right. You have insects, flying insects that bite. You have horseflies, mosquitoes, gnats, you know, prevention. I like DEET. When I go out, I go with 100% DEET. Everyone says I'm crazy, but I've been bitten by a tick and I've had uh, Lyme disease now for seven years and still dealing with that. So I use 100% DEET. Um, when I'm traveling overseas, I do take malaria pills. Um, one thing I thought was interesting when we were camping in Botswana, they want our dirty socks to put on one opposite side of our camp so that it attracts the mosquitoes. And in the morning, that thing was black with mosquitoes. You couldn't tell where the sock was or the mosquitoes ended. Um, so make sure if you do get stung by any of these things, the biggest problem is you can get a little swelling, itching, and use a little hydrocortisone. But I use D. That kind of prevents most of it. All right, we talked about the tick pull already. Lyme's disease, this is what the ticks transmit. Um, you wanna remove with fine tweezers. If you leave a mandible, you can just dig it out. You can bring it back to have identified by the uh, health department. The CDC has a location where you can actually send the tick to be tested, um, especially if it's feeding on you. All right, you know, they're all kinds of different colors. They, they like light colored clothing are more visible. So if you wear light colors in the field, you can see the ticks a little bit better. Um, 
again, I like uh, Berithium uh, on clothing and in the tent, and I use a lot of repellent. You know, even if they're dead, don't handle them. So you have insects like yellow jackets, hornets, wasps, bumblebees, carpenter bees. They all have reusable stingers that can sting up to 30 times a second. Now we have the killer hornets, and those things are giant. And you know they're about an inch and a quarter long. And again, they can sting 60, 30 times a second, whereas the old um, bumblebee only stings once and dies. Or not bumblebee, but honeybee. Right, so they do uh, produce venom. There can be allergic reactions. Uh, a swelling of a local area is a normal response, but if you start getting swelling and redness and other parts of your body, you're definitely sensitive to uh, bee stings and may have to get an EpiPen. Here's a quick description of how to use an EpiPen. Um, if you have any allergies, uh, allergies or you get allergic reactions, I highly recommend that you get a EpiPen and take with you. All right, hazardous plants, right? Everyone's heard the term leaves of three, leave them be. That's something that you got to make sure that, and you know, here we have poison oak. And as a fireman, I've been exposed numerous times because we go in areas where it's burning, we're cutting line or we're dragging our fire hose through it. And we get it on us a lot. The best way to get rid of it is the old ivory soap. It floats in water, which is kind of neat. Um, I highly recommend not doing it in a river or stream, but in some of our, um, we'll put up a little pond um, in a, a portable uh, catch basin and we'll wash inside there and you can use the soap to get the oils off your body. Right, because it's a um, it's an oil that um, you get exposed to, and it's in poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. All right, and here's your poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac. Poison oak, because we have here on the west coast, but poison ivy and poison sumac you have in other parts of the country. So that's all I have right now. Um, I like what Codeine says from Dual Survivor Survival. Uh, there's no system to survive. Nature tells you what she wants. You can listen to her and live, or you can ignore her and die. I always like leaving with a never be afraid to try something new. Professionals built the Titanic and amateurs built the art. So I will get rid of my screen. I will stop the share. And we'll get into the dog and pony show. Well, to tell you the truth, our, our panelists have uh, answered almost all the questions that have come in. Uh, you did such a thorough job that they didn't really have too many questions. So. Huh. Okay. We're, we're, we're looking very good. Uh, I know we exceeded time-wise, so in that time that you were up, we've covered everything there is, and uh, right. we still have a lot of people with us, so thanks for uh, sticking around. We enjoyed bringing this to you, and uh, Alex and Jim, thank you so much for giving your time this night for uh, our constituents out there who are joining us. All right. We yeah. really appreciate it. All right, well, um, that, that's it for tonight. This will be recorded. Uh, we'll be put it on our um, YouTube channel and our um, Advanced Hunter Ed uh, Clinics page. Uh, the next clinic will be on virtual scouting. I have not put it up yet, but it will be um, up there probably by the middle of next week. We will cover the Onyx Maps app, the Google Earth apps, and any other type of tools that we can help you for doing virtual scouting before you go out and enter the field. Just like Alex was saying, it's good to know where you're going and, and have a plan. So we're gonna help you with that next uh, time we meet. So until then, uh, good night, everybody. All right. Thank you, panel. All right, thank you. things like extra back and battery and stuff. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, look how,